Thank you, Evelyn. And um, I'm going to add to the chorus of thanks um, to uh, the Barnes Foundation and to Sylvie for uh, the invitation to speak today, um, and also to the team here at the Barnes who really have welcomed, welcomed us so warmly, especially Aaliyah, who has just managed everything. Can't, can't say enough. Uh, good things about her, and um, all of us here, I think, um, feel an enormous debt of gratitude to Georges and Wanda at the Matisse Archives and to Barbara Dutuy. And I would say that the dialogue uh, with the three of them um, over the course of our work on Matisse has really been essential. We're delighted to be here, uh, Carl and I, to discuss the research around our exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art on Rematisse, The Cutouts. The spark for the exhibition and the work at its conceptual and philosophical core is the museum's monumental cutout, The Swimming Pool. In 1952, Matisse created this cutout, um, composed in a palette of blue cut shapes against a frieze of white paper, and it was pinned to the burlap covered walls um, of his dining room, spanning all four walls. And I think most of you know um, kind of the origin story of this work, but I'll just say it again. Um, so Matisse had asked uh, Lydia to, um, to take him to a local pool to see divers, and he got there, and it was so hot um, that he said, oh, I have to go home to get out of this heat. Um, and when he got home, he said, I'm going to make my own pool. Um, and that's exactly what he did. Um, after Matisse's death, the work was traced and removed from the walls and then mounted onto nine panels, each of which consisted of the cut blue shapes, the white paper, and the burlap ground. The swimming pool was acquired by MoMA and then by 1993, following its installation in John Elderfield's Matisse retrospective, it was determined that the condition of the burlap had so deteriorated that the swimming pool could no longer be shown. In 2008, Carl Buckberg, our senior conservator at the museum, set out to conserve this work. And from the very beginning of his efforts, Carl and I spoke about the possibility of organizing a small exhibition around the swimming pool. And as we explored the idea, as all of you know who've seen the show, we concluded that a broader reassessment of Matisse's cutouts, a closer look at, at the whole body of work, was due. The swimming pool, though, was really a lens for us through which Matisse's practice could be understood. So in embarking, in embarking on our work together, we asked three um, seemingly simple questions. What is a cutout? How is it made? And what does that making mean? So today, I will start out um, by discussing how we came to answer those questions. Then I'm going to turn the podium over to Carl to discuss the conservation of the swimming pool. And then I'm going to return to the podium again to address the place of the swimming pool in Matisse's practice. So as a review, which I think most of you don't need, but I'm going to do it anyway, um, in the final decade of his life, Matisse worked with painted paper as his primary medium and scissors as his chief implement, inventing a new form of, new form of art that came to be called a cutout. Matisse cut painted sheets into various shapes, from the organic to the geometric, which he then arranged into lively compositions, striking for their play with color and contrast. He described this approach as drawing with scissors. Though this story generally begins in the mid-1940s, Matisse had already been using cut paper in the 1930s as an expedient, as we heard earlier, to shortcut his laborious process of revision. Um, so it was not yet a method. Um, and I'm showing you the Barnes mural, where, um, which we're lucky enough um, to experience firsthand here and for which he used this, uh, this cut cut paper expedient. Um, so, and, and that cut paper allowed him to sculpt and abstract the figures and flatten the space they dance, the, the figures dance in. So it wasn't until his work on jazz, one of the 20th century's great artist books, that what had be began as an expedient became a full-blown method, what Matisse described as a cut-out operation. In this operation, Cutting was more than a simple procedure. It provided him a system of expanding the possibilities of shape and composition. So if you think about making a cut into a sheet of paper, you automatically get two shapes. 
Um, and if you cut out a shape um, you know, completely, then you get um, what's really a positive and a negative, what we would call a positive and negative. But for Matisse, all those forms were equally valid. Um, and you can see that in a work like this composition, um, Black and Red, where um, the you know, this form is cut out of this, this piece of paper, and so both of them find an equal place in the composition. So um, cutting allowed Matisse to see all possibilities of form, the positives and negatives, as I'm showing you here, um, reversals and inverses that you see throughout um, jazz, and also the organic relations between shapes, their generation from one to another. From the beginning of our research, we were attuned to the, um, well, let me back up. In addition to the making, um, to the thinking through of the possibilities of cutting, from the beginning of our research, we were attuned to the life of the cutouts in Matisse's studio. While the studio, while the studio had long been a subject for Matisse, as we saw in so many presentations in the, in the last day or so, in the invention and making of the cutouts, the studio went from being a subject to the support. Using his studio walls as a blank canvas, Matisse composed and recomposed his cut paper forms. Matisse lived in and among his cutouts, orchestrating a luminous environment. Our attention to Matisse's studio stemmed in large part from our work on the swimming pool. Itself an environment, it encouraged, it, it encouraged us to take note of Matisse's environmental ambitions. But there were two other parts of our research that pushed us in this direction. First, the, Matisse's, the work's material properties. Matisse created this work with two simple materials, white paper and gouache, and an unorthodox implement, a pair of scissors. Studio assistants painted sheets of paper with gouache, selected by Matisse, and after they dried, Matisse would choose a sheet, and as he put it, cut directly into vivid color. Matisse would use pins to compose his forms. Um, pinning them to a board that sat on his lap or directing assistants to pin forms onto the wall. And it was this use of pins that we concluded was absolutely essential to Matisse and essential to our understanding of the work. Um, something pinned, um, as you all know, can be unpinned and therefore it can be changed. Um, so this seemingly small observation had enormous consequences, leading us to understand the studio as a place of constant re revision and flux, as Matisse continually revised and altered these works. And the works themselves also told the story in the hundreds of pinholes that you can still see, a record of the process of their making. Lending support to this material understanding was access to photographs from the Matisse archive and other archives, which corroborated our sense of the work's contingency and mutability. Forms were pinned in one grouping um, and then removed to join another. And so you can see here this work from the Menil originally on the wall was in a kind of side-by-side -side configuration and then was eventually it found its way to this final version in this vertical configuration. And there are lots of examples of, of that. Um, whole compositions were moved from one wall to another or one studio to another. Moreover, these photographs also helped us to understand the importance of Matisse's engagement with the walls of his studio and his ambitions to work on an architectural scale. And I'm showing, well, you can see from the, the um, caption, these are various uh, slides of the parakeet and mermaid in process. By the time Matisse began work on the pool, he had already made the move from his lap to the wall, using those surfaces to compose and consider his work in cut paper installing, editing, shifting, and altering assemblies of forms. From smaller works clustered on architectural surfaces to form patchwork holes that you can see here, each element subject to continual editing, Matisse's ambitions grew, provoking him to stretch larger compositions across his studio walls, extending vertically and laterally into and across corners from floor to ceiling and exploiting the compositional, structural, and decorative possibilities of the wall as a surface without a frame, moving beyond the bounds of easel painting. 
The Vons Chapel, of course, gave Matisse the opportunity to think environmentally. The reach of that project extended from the luminous effects of stained glass and the contrasting whiteness of the tile to how the colors of the garments worn by the priests as they moved through the chapel's interior would impact the visual and physical experience of worshipers. The influence of this project is immeasurable, fueling Matisse's desire to go bigger with cut paper. Our hope then for the exhibition was to get back to this fluctuating and ever-changing place that was the studio and to show that the cutouts had two lives. First on the studio walls where they were contingent and mutable, when shapes were merely pinned, exhibited pliability and moved with a breeze. And second, after they left the studio when they were glued down and made permanent. This interest we had in conveying the liveliness of the cutout to Matisse's studio was shared by some of Matisse's friends and colleagues who visited the studio and were astonished by what they saw arrayed across the walls. Andre Rouvier argued for the cutout's material qualities. Quote, these paper cutouts have a very pure existence when they escape from your hands, your scissors, their papery substance with subtle plays of light on their flexibility. And the very physics of this flexibility all contribute um, to the making of a miraculous thing that retains its essence when stuck up on the wall with pins by Lydia. And I'm showing you a little bit of an earlier work from the 1930s, but just um, this is a work that still has that kind of flexibility. And I'm showing it to you, obviously, in breaking lights. So you can really see the way the work kind of um, had a pliability um, and was and kind of leaned off the wall. Emmy Mogg's take is even more intriguing. In um, a 1948 letter, he grapples with what he saw during a recent visit. Noting the work's rhythm, he wonders if it might be, quote, a starting point for the realization of an interesting film where rhythm, colors, forms, and sounds would come together and respond to each other along the lines of Walt Disney's Fantasia. Very intriguing, yes? <laughs> So while the notion of a filmic version of the cutouts is fascinating, I think that's a whole other thing we should look at, it doesn't solve the issue of in-person presentation, which was, which was our focus. For that, Mog reports, he has conducted his own experiment, focusing on the essential role of the pins, what he calls the manifestation of the fixing point. In his plan, the cutouts would live in a shadow box cut paper um, pinned with phonograph, with phonograph needles, and this is a quote, that once rusted would solidly be embedded in a plywood support. And he even understood that, that the degradation of materials, just to follow up on our, our, our just the recent presentation, he writes, a piece of wax paper placed between the paper and the wood will prevent the paper from touching the acid-soaked wood. Though there is no rejoinder from Matisse to this tantalizing suggestion, if only. Um, our new presentation of the swimming pool allowed us to take up the possibilities that the pins offer um, and, emphasizes, and emphasize Matisse's engagement with the walls of the studio, his embrace of contingency, his deployment of the visual power of positive and negative, his keen sense of balance and color. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carl for the next section. The viewer is struck by the cut paper sections with conspicuously varied brush applications. This is the result of the individual application of gouache to each sheet of paper, varied because of the thickness of gouache used and also by the, quote, hand of the separate uh, studio assistants. So what you're seeing here, this is lighter. Here you see this is lighter, that's darker. That is not a uh, degradation. That is actually the choice of Matisse of different pieces of blue paper. So the papers would be painted, they'd be dried, they'd be stored. Matisse would ask for a color or many colors. He would be given a choice and then he would choose. We continue to learn even more about the color from a set of small painted paper swatches which date from the cutout period and represent the colors used by Matisse, compiled by Georges Matisse and donated to MoMA by the Matisse family. We know from contemporary Linnell color charts that gouache was produced in a wide range of colors. So here is the sample set 
And on the left is uh, samples provided to the Brody family for the Brody Commission in Los Angeles. It's interesting that uh, Georges set, which tries to pull together all the different colors, is much larger than what was uh, sent to the Brodies. Anna Martins, conservation scientist at MoMA, has analyzed these samples over the past years. Her finding to be published when the analysis is complete shows that there is, in fact, a wide range, although some samples which appear to differ, differ only because of the application of gouache, not chemical composition. And such is the case with Matisse's blues, which are uniformly ultramarine. So these are all the same, chemical composition. In a July 23rd, 1976 letter from Lydia de la Torsai to MoMA Conservation, she states, these three elements, the outline, the composition, and the tone of the gouache, are the components of the original work. They belong to the art of the painter and are sacred for the person performing the lining. However, if there is not a drawing or trace of charcoal, the support, the white background, usually cast on paper, is nothing sacred in itself. By indicating the desired dimensions, these forms, backgrounds, were cut by a workshop. The hand of the artist did not participate. In an extreme situation, to replace it would not be a crime. So that was part of the decision-making process about replacing uh, the white background or not. Uh, areas uh, of the blue uh, uh, swimming pool were just touched back with a little bit of in-painting with a uh, colored pencil to knock back previous in-painting, which had happened at a, I must say, undisclosed time. Other than that, uh, no other change to the blue was taken place. The ultimate remounting of the paper cut shapes and white frieze to the burlap was the, by far the most complicated, but also the most interesting phase of the decision-making process. The chemical incompatibility between the new burlap, and the new burlap is essentially as, as acidic as the old burlap, and the paper elements made an overall adhesive mounting a most unattractive alternative. The curatorial conservation discussion of the importance of pins led to a decision to pin the work onto a new solid burlap covered support. I made, with the help of an assistant, a full scale pinned mock up of one of the large panels, and as conservators often do, I consulted with many other conservators, especially conservators dealing with Matisse cutouts, about the idea of pinning instead of overall mounting. So essentially, I made a tracing of the original panel, painted cans on paper blue, uh, cut them out, uh, bought new cans on paper and mounted it. You can see that Lefebvre one did a nicer job than I did because theirs was flat and mine was not. Um, <laughs> and, and then pinned this to the original panel uh, that it came off of. However, the bur you, you might ask the question, is this the burlap? It's not. The burlap was actually stretched over linen, so this is the secondary support, but I used it. The original pinholes through which the blue cut shape still exist, and it was through these holes that I used for the repinning. So I hope you can see there's a little pin there. Uh, originally, the white paper frieze would have been pinned to the studio wall, but as this paper now has no pins, I decided for the reinstallation not to reintroduce any new holes where they were not necessary. So originally, there would have been holes against the original white, in the original white paper because that's what kept it to the wall. Pinning returns to the work some of the three-dimensionality and liveliness that a cutout must have had originally. The, this decision is by far the most radical of the whole procedure, as no Matisse cutout has ever been removed from a mount and then subsequently pinned. The new solid uh, burlap supports uh, covered mounds replicate the height of the dining room in the Hotel Regina, allowing the white paper frieze to be pinned at the original height. This was one of my original goals, especially as correspondence held in the MoMA archive between Pierre Matisse and Bill Rubin expressed the dissatisfaction regarding the height at which it had been hung after the 1975 purchase. So here you see an example of the uh, way it used to be at MoMA, and um, you can see that the height, there is no person standing there, but it's, it's sort of a belly, belly height. 
for the Matisse Cut Out exhibition, the swimming pool was installed in a room of the exact same dimension as the dining room at the Hotel Regina. In previous installations, when entered through a doorway, so I can just go back here, you entered through uh, this doorway, you walked through it, and then out another door. In this new installation, one enters and exits the room through one single doorway, exactly the same size as it was originally, and is surrounded by the cutouts. Women with monkeys, it now in the collection of the Ludwig Museum, but originally composed over the entry doorway, was returned to this location for the cutout exhibition, completing the original ensemble. Um, though we are presenting different parts of our research here, our thinking evolved in tandem. Revelations about materials or architecture impacted our sense of the swimming pool's operation, effects and ambitions, and investigations into how the swimming pool function fed decisions about its conservation and new presentation. So out of our dialogue emerged a series of questions. If the swimming pool is the culmination of Matisse's work in cut paper up until that point, which is what we believed, how did he get there? And in the pool itself, what were the key strategies he deployed? I want to offer a few answers to these questions next, which first requires a return to 1952 um, and then a deep dive into the pool itself. So the year began with the commission for stained glass on the theme of Christmas from the Time Life Company. I'm showing you that here. Soon after, Matisse embarked on a project that turned out to be essential to the creation of the swimming pool, his blue nudes. Now, it should not be surprising to anyone here that Matisse would use cut paper to take on the subject of a seated female nude. Reducing his palette to focus intensely on the human form, he labored for weeks on what came to be called blue nude number four. That's what I'm showing you here. Beginning at first, finishing at last, and then and along the way, recording the process in this series of photographs. Um, so uh, with this, um, what, what I would say is that though this sequence of photographs makes his efforts look kind of natural or easy, um, so difficult was this process that Matisse briefly abandoned the nascent work. But you, you can see that he moves from, um, you know, from something that was kind of very, very bulky, and then um, it, in one, just to take one part of it, kind of her waist ends up being, you know, closer to a point. He moves the head, and the um, the thighs get slimmed out. Um, but he was so frustrated over the process that he that he abandons it um, and turns to his sketchbook as a kind of relief. Um, Learning the form with pencil and pen, drawing the figure over and over and over again, he was soon able to cut the other three blue nudes with, um, with mastery, at least according to Lydia, um, and finally finished um, the first one, which is now called number four. It's a little bit confusing. Um, so um, as opposed um, to building up the form um, with bits, as he did um, in the one he started first but finished last that I'm showing you here, for the other three, he used a kind of different method. Um, and what he would do is he would slice into a sheet of paper and then separate the two sides so that the white below does the work of defining. And you can really see how in, in Blue New Number 2, all of that can kind of come back together. And you can imagine it, imagine it returning to the single sheet it was cut from. Um, Though Matisse's scissors only make contact with the blue paper, he harnesses the physical, sculptural, and illuminative power of white. Now, in the pool, Matisse also does it, has a kind of similar method. He enlarges the white troughs that we've seen in the blue nudes, lengthening and widening them until they have their own physical presence. And you can see that um, in this um, in, uh, work in a part like this, where um, the kind of um, physical property of that white form um, comes forward. Um, and then in the work's largest and most grandly sculptural body that's there, um, what he's done is he's um, he simply um, cut this sheet of paper um, in, in 
you know, through, through half of it and slides the halves apart to create a female silhouette from the space between. Now, the white does not work alone, of course. Its tension with the blue is one of many around which the pool is organized. Positive and negative, figure and ground, limitation and expansion, inside and outside, up and down, air and water, animal and human, parts and holes, forms and inverses. One of the pool's strengths is its play with these terms, the oscillation of seeing a figure from one perspective and ground from another, air from one perspective and water from another, body from one perspective and liquid from another, and so on. As we enter the room, where are we? The frieze is above us, and Matisse likely composed it seated. So are we at the bottom of the pool looking up, above the pool looking down? Are we treading water alongside the swimmers, watching as their bodies cross in and out of the water? All answers, I think, are equally valid. Um, and it was, um, in some ways, the many forms um, that cutting yielded um, that I mentioned earlier that made Matisse, Matisse so uniquely able to see the possibilities and potentials of such visual flip-flopping. The swimming pool swirls, or really swims, around the viewer, generating a feeling of centerless circulation and immersion. It turns out that, as in the blue nudes, Matisse thought through this dynamic in drawing. Sketches made in an ordinary day planner, kindly shared with us um, by Georges and Wanda, um, offer a key to the pool's abstraction and dynamism. It was really exciting when, when, um, when we got to see these. On a sheet in the agenda dated July 20th, that's, that, that's that, um, the sheet on the left side, Matisse depicts a diving figure, head down, arms stretched out and tight against the head, legs pushing off the ground. In four similar drawings, um, as you go down the sheet, um, Matisse homes in on the arc formed when the spine curves over to dive, but he also addresses the body's limbs and breasts, reducing the female form to these features. Such reduction and simplification, the body condensed to arch, breast, and behind, is seen in other works made that summer, including, of course, the great acrobats. In backbends that match arm to leg, bulging head to tush, these contortionists echo the, the pool's vaguely corporeal figures, which similarly are all arched spine, breasts, and mermaid tail limbs. In a second set of drawings, um, the spread on the right, um, Matisse makes a visual rhyme between body and wave. Matisse explores two different curves, a reverse C and an S. Um, I think you can see that in those there, um, in relation to the female body. A languid swimmer moves horizontally across the left-hand page, one arm reaching out of the water, the other stroking forward. The entire body is a kind of serpentine line. In another sketch, the curve of the body mutates into a wave, moving in the opposite direction. And on the opposite page, a figure lolls lazily in the water, and the S shape of her body, talking about that there, um, legs out, bottom down, left arm stretched, is drawn in multiple configurations, and kind of morphs into a curve, a wave, and a wing. In each, the forward tilt of of the diver, the arched back and arm of the swimmer, and the undulating curve of the lounger are abstracted in, in a set of repeated strokes, creating watery waves, the serpentine shape of the arabesque. Now, the arabesque, we know from Roger Benjamin and many other scholars, is a key pictorial strategy for Matisse, which he deployed from almost the very beginning of his career to create, to, to create quote, an abstract plastic and pictorial energy. A consistent visual rhythm in Matisse's work. The arabesque is also responsible for the pool's energy, its dynamism, and its force. Almost all the bodies, whether human or fish, are arched. Threading one to another produces an up and down curve that echoes the agenda's shapes and waves. A perfect meeting of compositional force and subject, this up and down curve, this wave, um, drives the figures around the dining room or the pool, propels the swimmers through the water without stopping, giving the work a sense of endless circulation and limitless expansion. The arabesque is the perfect sign for water, which itself moves in undulating, sinuous curves, pushed by breezes or bodies. In the agenda, Matisse makes another reduction, a symbolic shorthand for the swimming pool. 
a double sine curve. That's right there. Linking the arabesque to infinite expansion. Matisse had long believed that the arabesque required containment in order to function dynamically, famously arguing, quote, the arabesque is effective only when contained by the four sides of the picture. With this support, it has strength. Working primarily in the realm of the easel picture, Matisse was perhaps re resigned to amplification that happened in the imagination. However, the cutouts, and specifically the play on the studio walls, allowed Matisse to imagine a curve infinitely expanding without any frame. Matisse articulated the arabesque's role and its formation on the wall as he saw it in Parakeet and Mermaid, an installation shot here on the wall. As you can see, it goes around the corner. And Matisse says, Look at this large composition, the foliage, fruits, scissors, a garden. The intermediary white is determined by the arabesque of the colored cut paper that gives this ambient white a rare and intangible quality. I just want to remind you of what the work looks like um, now um, laid out. So liberated by the wall, Matisse's arabesque is a force propelling a continuous circular movement, uh, a continuous circular movement without center and without end, finally fulfilling his aspiration to create space that extends as far as my imagination. Now, given the swimming pool's pictorial and metaphoric chain of body, arc, arabesque, wave, I want to finish by looking closely at what seems to be the simplest of cutouts and really one of my favorites. This is the one I would take home. <laughs> a, a work from this same blue and white mo moment in 1952 called The Wave. An echo of the sinuous swimmer wave sign curve in Matisse's agenda. The wave is really the apotheosis of this moment in Matisse's production and an emblem of his cutout practice as a whole. Made by cutting a curve into a rectangular blue sheet, dividing it in half, and sliding the two resulting sides apart to reveal the white not so much below it, but equivalent to it. The work's simple power derives from the tension Matisse creates between blue and white, positive and negative, flatness and depth. Though it is small, and it is, it is pretty small size compared to something like the parakeet and, and, and mermaid, it refers to limitlessness, the infinite expansion to which Matisse had always aspired. Though this expansion seems to be lateral, it should be noted that Matisse tried out the wave in, as a, in a vertical orientation. A, that's right here. A kind of paper equivalent to Brancusi's endless column. As an abstraction of water and body, and as a perfect reflection of the arabesque or serpentine line, the wave demonstrates with absolute directness the cutout's economy of means, while its subject coincides perfectly with its material condition, the endlessly rolling fluid repetition of waves. In its representation of infinity, as a sign for expansion, it also stands for potentiality. For Matisse, in 1952, possibility, the, the lexicon of cut paper, proliferated unbounded across his studio walls. Thanks very much.